We're like 30 seconds early. No, 10 seconds early, maybe? <clears throat> I think maybe they'll live. <laughs> yeah, they'll. It's our gift to you. Yes. Our gift to the fans. We'll show up like a. Join us early. 10 seconds early. So you can totally see the wormhole in the background there. <laughs> I don't know what my software decided it wanted to do. It just decided that part of the consistently blue wall yeah. is uh, lit in such a way. So apparently there's an earthquake, what, up in Anchorage? <clears throat> no. That That's what it's looking like. Yeah, no. Uh, it, it, was there a closer earthquake to me? Is that the one you're talking about, Nancy? Um, no, no. Uh I mean, I've felt like a like a four point nine magnitude earthquake isn't much. Um, those are fine. You feel those all the time here. Uh, yeah, it's we when get they those cross here into too. the fives that they start to feel pretty significant. But I've gone through five, five and a half uh, earthquakes here, no problem. They're definitely nerve wracking. But no one as far away as Australia, uh, sorry, as 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 Alaska, no. Oh, the Anchorage one was seven. Um, yeah, Ooh. so that's okay, that's, that's getting more significant. Uh, yeah, the one that I saw. Yeah, that's things fall over. Yeah, it was four point nine. So seven is seven is definitely more, but still not uh, that big of a that big of a deal. Um, f for this distance, like we wouldn't feel it. And apparently the tsunami warning has been lifted. So, uh, but hopefully there was no significant damage up in Anchorage. Yeah, I mean, we've yeah. had. I think the worst one that we had, we had like an eight point eight or something like that that was a, about a thousand kilometers away from here and again we didn't even feel it here like apparently wow. they were it was happening but uh you know it was just happened just south of uh Haida Gwaii and and we didn't feel it and that was about a year and a half ago or so so anyway they they happen pretty significant earthquakes happen all up and down the coast and unless you're really close um you're not gonna you're not gonna really feel it okay yeah, I was in the Soviet Union when they had some that were magnitude high six point something. And it was one of these things where we all had to leave our buildings and stay outside because um, it was just too reminiscent of the earthquakes that like flattened large chunks of, of um, I think it was Azerbaijan. The worst, are you using the right camera? Which camera I don't do you know. think I you're think so. streaming from? Okay, yeah, all yeah, right. all right. Um, yeah, the worst one that I think the worst experience that we've had here on the island was there was an Alaska earthquake, and it was a it was a little stronger than that. I think it was in the eight point six range, mm -hmm. and it it but it did generate a tsunami that came down the coast and made its way up into the um, uh, one of the straits on the outside of the island and got funneled up right into this city that we have um, and was just devastating. Like it just flooded the whole city and just caused an enormous amount of damage. And so that's the problem that we have. We face, especially all the cities that are connected by these fjords on the outside of Vancouver Island, is you get yeah. these, you get these, these tsunami waves will come in and they'll just get funneled into this really um, tight, very powerful wave that then just inundates the city. And there's usually a city at the end of every one of these things. So you get these really deadly waves that come right down and, uh, and wipe them off the map. And that's what, and that's what happened uh, in the 1940s, I think. And that's the last time we've had really significant damage. <laughs> so someone just posted a picture of Alaska. This is crazy. Look in the road, just yeah. torn up, scary. Wow. Yeah, it's it's not on the front page. Oh, now it is of Washington Post. So okay. yeah, they have a video of a road collapsing in Alaska. May magnitude seven earthquake causes major damage. Unfortunately, is what yeah. they're saying. Yeah, and a lot of the roads there are like if you've ever been to Anchorage, uh, the permafrost buckles the road year after year after year. And so when yeah. you drive on the roads in, in Alaska, because the permafrost melts every year and then comes back and melts, you get the roads are just like these, it's like a, a roller coaster Frosties. ride as you drive along them, right? Because they just go up and down yeah. and up and down and up and down. And so you can just imagine this kind of earthquake is just going to take what are already fairly weakened roads and substrates and just dismantle them. So, wow. 
again, hope everyone's safe. Uh, winter time sucks. I don't know. Maybe winter time's yeah. a better time for this to happen. I don't know whether you want to have have, you know, whether it's worse to have it in the winter time or in the summertime. So anyway, I'm not sure. Yeah, I but just... I'm good thing that the it's terrifying and there's not a lot of daylight hours right now yeah yeah no i mean to be in one it is i mean we've i know we've 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 had a whole episode about this to be in an earthquake is a really unnerving experience because it does not feel like this undulation that's going on it is like someone is just shaking you really fast just shake 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 the, like this is the, speed. the analogy like, shake, shake, i use shake, shake, shake. it feels like there's a dog scratching on the bed yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly right. And you can feel the bed shaking at that, that pace, but it's like everything, everything around you in the whole house is shaking like that. All of your, um, your, you know, the, the shelves are shaking, the, the whole house, you can hear the house creaking. And the scariest time that I ever had was we were in a tower in downtown Vancouver back about, man, almost 20 years ago. And and like a 27 story tower and the whole thing was creaking back and forth and so you could hear the whole just the whole building going ring, 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 ring. Oh, did okay. you have the floating floors and everything oh uh, well i mean i mean all of the apartment towers in vancouver are built to the earthquake code so it was designed to handle this exact situation and as earthquakes go it wasn't that bad it was only say a five magnitude earthquake but still ugh, yeah. you know because you're like there's nothing i can do i can't get out i can't i can't go down yeah. i can't escape like whatever like now it all just comes down to whether my building has been built to code and uh yeah and it's uh yeah it's it's awful yeah, we have a fault near here that is one of the ones that there's a pretty much constant background of magnitude three earthquakes. And when it sets loose, because it's basically where the plate buckles, um, it it has a tendency to do things like flatten St. Louis and reverse the Mississippi temporarily. Uh, so we know our house will go away. But um, for the magnitude three wood, it turns out is a perfectly good thing, but the plaster tends to crack a lot. Yeah. Um, people are noticing the uh, the rug that you have on your lap. <laughs> um, no, that's not Eddie. This this is okay. I just laughed and woke her up, so I'm gonna dare to put her on camera. This is little Stella Sky. Uh huh. She completely fell asleep in my lap while I was down in the the um, downstairs prepping for the show, and. Um, Kyle's moving some furniture around and I was like I can't leave her alone because she's not yet to be trusted so since she was still asleep I carried her up here and um yeah she's she's at the stage of yeah okay I'll just sleep on you <laughs> oh, that's pretty adorable uh and yeah. you are the consummate professional Pamela um, all right. Speaking of, let's do our job. Um, I'm going to say okay. hi to a bunch of people first. Hello to what the? Oh no, I missed the hellos at the beginning, and now everyone's hellos have disappeared. Oh no. So I'm going to say hi to Dusty Reichwin, Graham W, Johnny J, Jordan Young, Nancy Grazian, Thomas Traniker, Zap Fan, Zap Fan, and then everybody else: Doug Ellis, Will Peppers, Janelle Duncan, Mikhail Hollanders, Brian Yoko, Andy Cowley, uh, Jordan Young. And Richard Hayes, Catalin Bontilla, Capital H, Nichols of the Yard. Uh, who else is here? Tom Harbin. Tom, sorry about the book. It sucks. Tom lives in the UK, and, and apparently uh, Amazon UK has run out of our books. Case Pens, 303. That's impressive okay. and awesome. Uh, Janelle Duncan, Esther Gagne, uh, Graham W., Harry Patrick, Tim Hayes. Uh, apologies if I missed you, the... YouTube hasn't uh, maintained everybody's names. Uh, right, so if you're wondering what it is you've stumbled into, we're going to do a live episode of Astronomy Cast, and we're going to take a break from the science and just dig right into all the cool stuff that we've had a chance to play with and see, and and we'll be able to make some recommendations for you all. So let's uh, let's get into it. And wait, I just realized I can drop you a link and you can show it to humans, even if I can't. Okay. Where, where will you 
drop this it's link. It's going to be in Zoom. Okay. Uh, uh, wow, that was yes. the world's worst link. Yes. Okay, I've got it. The chart okay. of cosmic exploration. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Are you uh, ready to do the thing? I am ready. I am pressing record and it's recording. Excellent. Wow. Computers, you do a thing and it does that thing. Hey, Chad. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 508, our 2018 holiday gift guide. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing great. Um, trying to think if there's any sort of shameless self-promotion before we get into uh, what is going to also contain a certain amount of shameless self-promotion, but also other stuff. Uh, <laughs> just a one, uh, one more reminder, I think, uh, is that uh, we're still taking uh, – reservations for our Costa Rica trip. People say I say Costa Rica and that's incorrect. It's Costa Rica with Dr. Paul Sutter and myself. Uh, which one is it? Costa Rica. Costa Rica. There we go. Costa Rica, not Costa Rica, Costa Rica. Anyway, uh, and with Dr. Paul Sutter and uh, we're able to take uh, reservations until the end of December. So you've got about, uh, um, about a month left if you want to join us and experience the volcanoes and the wildlife and the forests and the night sky. It's going to be a lot of fun. So you should come with us. And if you'd like to explore the Southwest instead with me in the fall. Don't make them choose. Uh, ast <laughs> astrotours.co slash starstrider. And we can go look at dark skies and desert landscapes with completely different critters and a whole lot less water. Awesome. Uh, but in either case, go to astrotours.co and then choose the tour of your of your choosing. Um, all right, let's move on. So uh, we did it. We made it to the end of another year. Once again, it's time to wonder what gifts to get your beloved space nerds. We've got some suggestions. Some are brand new this year. Others are classics that we just can't help but continue to suggest. So let's get into it. Now, should we... I mean, obviously, spoiler alert, and if you are the space nerd who is listening to this show, then maybe what you want to do is hand over the headphones to your significant other, your gift giver, um, and and let them listen to this show, and you miss this one and wait till after the fact, and that way they've got some good suggestions for what to get you. Or you can, of course, just say, provide a bunch of hints and add these things to your Amazon wish list, whatever the case. But uh, just fair warning... We're about to spoil whatever holiday gift giving plans you have already figured out. So, well, maybe not spoil. I'm hoping more we're going to inspire whatever gift giving. Sure. Plans. Yeah. yeah, we're going to suggest a bunch of stuff. You're then going to hand those things over to your to your friends, significant others, um, and they're going to purchase those gifts and then give them back to you, and you're going to pretend yes. to be surprised. I think that's the that's the I think that's the deal that we have to strike here. So, uh, well, so where do you want to start? Um, why don't we just go back and forth recommending things until we run out of time? That, I think that sounds good. So, so for me, the place to start is actually over on Redbubble. There are a ton of independent artists that can make space gear every which way you've ever dreamed of. I've been working really hard to try and buy stuff from the artists every Christmas for a long time. And I fell in love with Redbubble so much that I got the artists I love to actually contribute to a shop we have for CosmoQuest X. So this is where the shameless self-promotion mm. part comes in. So if you go over to redbubble.com slash people slash CosmoQuest X, or just search on CosmoQuest X, we have a whole series of Space So Sweet sweatshirts, t-shirts, all the different stuff that you might want to print things on. And it's stuff like 
a ice cream cone where you're dripping ice cream is Saturn. It's a group of shooting stars that happen to actually be cookies, including an animal cracker of a flying pig. And they're just super creative. And it's fun to have spacey things that make even non-spacey spacey people smile and grin. And uh, so, yeah, snuggle up in a warm hoodie. That's what I'm doing today. And uh, fly your geek flag with a little bit of space. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to recommend is, and this came in the mail for me from National Geographic. So thanks, National Geographic. Uh, and this is the second edition Space Atlas, Mapping the Universe and Beyond. So it's a book, and it is a gig <laughs> It's a, it's a big book, you know, big coffee table book, 350-ish uh, pages that has really the nicest photography uh, for both the solar system through to the universe, the sun, the Milky Way, uh, and has, you know, it's an atlas really of the entire universe. And it's, it, it makes me think of back to the Our Universe uh, book that I yeah. loved as a child and actually bought a copy used that's on its way to me now. So I'm going to actually get one and then I'll just be lost in nostalgia. But but this is sort of in exactly the same same field, which is this really gigantic, hefty book with a ton of amazing pictures that you can just pour over. Every page pretty much has, you know, is, is a full page image of you know of the moon all of the craters on the moon and then something similar for mercury and a lot of these images are brand new just created uh you know although some of the underlying photographs you've seen before a lot of it is actually really brand new imagery that's created and now it's on the ground so for this uh but but just a beautiful book so if you're looking for like one big book to give a space nerd that's my recommendation Okay, so the next thing that I want to uh, mention is something that I already shot you the link for, and I'm going to try and share it to those folks watching over on Slack, and we love all of you over the Weekly Space Hangout, uh, wshcrew.space. Um, this item is the chart of cosmic exploration. This is one of the many amazing uh, infographics that comes from the good people at Par Pop Chart Lab. Uh, I found them over on Etsy. They have their own website as well. And Pop Chart Lab does infographics of all sorts of different things. They have birds of North America. They have, a, if you could do an Instagram of it, they've probably done it. The chart of cosmic exploration is a chart that has all the different planets and Pluto, whether you call it a planet or not, and it shows all the spacecraft that through the fullness of history have made it out and what was their path between these worlds, between their moons, as they did the exploration. We actually have this hanging up in our CosmoQuest's office here in Edwardsville. Um, I love it. It's gorgeous. It's fabulous. It's framed for me. And so go get it on Etsy. Again, buying directly from the artist. Uh, that is awesome. I really love those uh there's ones that are like comparison of different kinds of rockets and they're all drawn yeah. in the exact same style but you can really see the different sizes um and that's really great all right so the next thing i'm going to recommend um is a thing called a move a globe and i don't know if you have one so so i'm holding this up to the audience uh for those of you who are listening on the podcast you're just gonna have to Im imagine it but what it is is it's like a sphere of hard plastic and then inside the sphere is another sphere that contains something a globe and so in it you know they they sell a bunch of them uh the one that i have is of the night sky um and they they sent it to me so again i you know just to let you know i didn't purchase it but uh but they sent it to me but they're beautiful and they sort of slowly rotate and you can see all of the constellations um they've got one of mars they've got one of pluto they've got like all these different objects that you know of of the universe and you can uh just have one kicking around and i i love it and i actually keep it on my desk and a lot of the times when i'm trying to figure out sort of what constellation is going to be up for the night when i'm uh you know getting prepped for a star party i just sort of keep the thing around and look at what region of the sky i'm going to be able to see the downside of these things is that they 
there's no way to control the inside sphere. And so, yeah. and so I can't actually like turn the thing around to see the if you part of the look sky at the that bottom, I want to see. Yeah, if you you're just to... kind of stuck. Yeah, you're stuck. You can't flip the thing over because by flipping it over, it's really hard to explain, but like the, <laughs> the, the, the sphere just keeps turning in your hands and there's no way to. So anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to look at and they're, it's great, but it is really tough to um, be able to see uh, a specific part of it without just waiting for it to slowly turn around. You can kind of give it a jiggle to get it spinning but then it's just spinning too quickly. So uh, they're really, they're great. I really like them. Thanks to Mova Globes for sending me one. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for something that's sort of a nice way to show off your love of the night sky, uh, check these out. And and then the next thing for me is the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada every year puts out a sky atlas. And it's this little book that has listed in it when are all the meteor showers? When are the planets going to be up? And beyond that, it also has information that you're going to want pretty much forever. Double stars, globular clusters, lists upon lists upon lists. This is the go-to guide to have sitting next to your telescope. Yep. And you know, you don't have to update it every year, but if you have someone in your life who uses a telescope, go ahead and get them one. They're going to love it. Yeah. Uh, to go along with that guide of, of, you know, I mean, that's really like what's happening over the course of the year and for the upcoming years. All of the stuff that we can predict that are special to go out and watch. And, yeah, absolutely. We, we rely on that. I know Dave Dickinson uh, depends on that book, and it's great that, that it's a Canadian publication. Um, yes. To go along with that, um, I'm going to recommend two pieces of observing gear and we, you know, we make these recommendations every year, but I want to just like lay it down in stone here. First, if a person is really into seeing the night sky and wants to get into astronomy, start with a pair of astronomical, astronomical binoculars. I recommend the, you know, the 15 by 75s, which is a good, um, sort of a balance between the aperture and the magnification that you're going to get with the just sort of the weight of carrying these things around. They make a bigger one at 25 by hundreds, but they're just too big. So go Those. with the 15 by 75s. It's a great way to learn the night sky. And then the second thing is to go with a Dobsonian telescope. I'm now convinced we had the star party at Astronomy Cast 500. I got a chance to play with every single different kind of telescope and the um, the Dobsonians were just, I just kept going back to these Dobsonians because yeah. you grab the front of the telescope, wrench it around to a new target. Uh, it's very robust, um, uh, very quick to be able to do it. And if anyone's got one of the fancier telescopes, if you've gone and gotten a um, you know, like a nice Mead or a Celestron with a great little motor drive and you spend all night, you, you're like, oh, Saturn's up. Okay, everybody, let's go take a look at it. And then an hour later, you're still trying to polar align the telescope and make it track Saturn. Just don't do it. <laughs> just go to, <laughs> um, uh, just go with uh, a nice Dobsonian. They're inexpensive for a, uh, maybe a, by, you know, for like an eight inch telescope, you're going to spend maybe $300, $350. Yeah. And it is just the greatest way to start. There's a great time. Um, I don't know what you call them. It's like a, like a target, like a Telerad, whatever it is. Telerad. The, yeah, yeah. It's Telerad. Yeah. It looks like a bullseye. It's like a, with, they're fabulous. So great. So fast. And so if you know the sky, then you just go with that and you could, uh, uh, Oh, it's it's the greatest. So that's 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 my recommendation. If you if you want to get someone their first way to see the night sky, get them the binoculars. And if you just want to go with, you, you know, you're going to want to look at the moon and Saturn and Jupiter and some of the brighter objects, then go with that Dobsonian telescope. And it's just the and, fastest way. And really, everyone wants a good pair of binoculars, no matter what you're doing. And, and I personally like my binoculars to have a slightly bigger field of view. So I go with a pair of 10 by 42s and that makes it easy to star hop, to go find the big faint fuzzies that are out there sprawling across the sky, but you need a dark location if you're doing this. But the 
thing that you get to do with binoculars that you don't get to do really any other way is just star hop. And for star hopping, this is where it starts to get cool to have, well, some of the cool software that's out there. And this is where you just take your friend's device and you're like, let me help you. And you install Stellarium for them. It's completely free. Yes. And give them the binoculars, show them Stellarium, put it in the night sky settings, and you're off and you can find things. And for your phone, there's all sorts of different apps. Find the one you like best. Try all of them. Most of them are free. Um, that allow you to move your phone around and figure out exactly what it is that you're looking at. So yeah. don't forget software while you're in the process of spending buku bucks to find things. You have to have the software to find the things too. Yep. Uh, all right, time for another book. Uh, so this is not space, but it's space adjacent. And this is uh, the new Skeptic's Guide to the Universe book by Steve Novella and the rest of the team at Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And if you listen to the Skeptic's Guide, uh, you know how just smart they are. I mean, Steve Novella knows everything about everything and uh, has finally taken the time to write the comprehensive book on being a on being a skeptic, and uh, you know the book that got me into skepticism originally was the was Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. That that really? book just blew my mind. Oh yeah, yeah. I would I was definitely not a skeptic until I read Demon Haunted World, and then. Upon reading it, I was like, okay, yep, I get it. This is, of course, um, you know, people believe in nonsense and they shouldn't believe in nonsense and and this is the way to do it. And, um, and from that point forward, I've sort of perceived the world with entirely new eyes and and the same thing goes, you know, is the is the modern version of that is the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe's new book. I mean, if you listen to the podcast, I hope you already know about it. But if you didn't realize, if you used to listen to the podcast and you didn't realize that you come out with a book, uh, it's out and it's wonderful. So uh, definitely go with that. Well, I'm going to go back to equipment because that's kind of the thing that I apparently know better because I read fiction mostly. Um, so, so the thing that I'd recommend there is Celestron Next Image. There's a whole series of these little webcams that are designed for your eyepiece. And sometimes you just want to share what you're looking at with the world or at least someone who's inside where it's warm. And these next images will let you do that. They'll let you show up on a big screen what it is that someone would see if they look through your little eyepiece. This makes it easier for people like little kids who don't necessarily know how to look through eyepieces. And, and they're not that expensive. I'd get the most expensive one you can afford because what you can see does get better, the more expensive, but the low end one for 140, while still not cheap, it's a webcam for your telescope yeah. and it will give you shiny, happy views. And so one sort of connected to that, one thing that's really uh, amazing this, you know, and this modern age is, of course, you've got a pretty powerful CCD camera that's sitting in your pocket with your phone. And now yes. there are a lot of really great clips that are made for telescopes that will allow you to attach your phone and have it be the the camera that you're that you're using to take pictures. And um, I've seen some great shots of, of the entire solar system. People have done a collage of the sun and the moon and all of the planets where all of the pictures were done taken with their phone camera. Because yeah. the great thing about the about the phones is, you know, because these objects are very bright, you don't need to have a big long exposure. That's what the phones are not great for. Uh, yet, although apparently there is some some astronomy software that people are developing for phones, but for for very quick exposures, your phone camera is actually really good. It's about holding it still and keeping it at the right distance and being able to focus it into the you know and have it act as as the eyepiece. So, um, if you're looking for something you know some kind of stocking stuffer gadget for someone who who has got a new telescope but wants to maybe start taking some pictures. This is the great first way to get into astrophotography. So, it, and they're not that expensive. You can buy them yeah. for uh, ten, twenty dollars. Uh, most of the manufacturers now will offer these, and I highly recommend. You know, just add a phone, um, 
a quick phone clip for uh, for your telescope. And yeah, I really can't say anything better than that, other than if you start to know someone who's getting into astrophotography, uh, I still find the Canon cameras are the best ones for doing astrophotography. And once you have someone who's willing to be outside that long, they now make Bluetooth foot warmers. So when you're thinking about what to get your astronomy pal, don't forget it's cold out there and you don't always have a friend who wants to go with you, but foot warmers sometimes are better than a friend. So consider uh, at least chemical packs or something like that to help them keep warm out there and never touch your eyeball to an eyepiece. Uh, so the next thing I'm gonna recommend is Lego. Uh, there's a ton of really great space related Lego sets that have come out over the last couple of years. Um, the Mars rover has been uh, immortalized in Lego. And the big one that came out, I think over the last year, was the Saturn V Apollo 11 set, which is the entire Saturn V stack, the um, the Apollo, you know, the, the entire command module and the lunar module and even the astronauts. Um, and it's all there. Um, and it's thousands of pieces, and I've seen some people taking a long time to build them, but uh, having a lot of fun. So, and it had a, like a ridiculously good price over the boxing, or sorry, over the uh, Black Friday sales. I think you could get the whole set for like $99. So I don't know if it's gonna come out again uh, shortly, but the price was really inexpensive for what is an enormous amount of Lego and will keep you busy yeah. for a while. And and um, the uh, SpaceX, set has just been approved. I don't know if it's going to uh, be available uh, yet before the holidays, but, um, and there was a great set of female astronauts that came out as yeah. well. So Lego has been doing a great job of, of providing scientifically accurate-ish uh, Lego sets that match some of the really great uh, epochs of space exploration. So uh, if you're looking for something, uh, check out all the different Lego space exploration Lego sets. And, and the knockoffs are actually not terrible. So I'm going to admit to having the Chinese knockoff Saturn V and the pieces fit together just fine. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Has it's the patent the expired? Are they allowed to do that now? Hmm. What was that? Has the patent expired? Are they allowed to do that now? Uh, I'm not sure anyone's really worried about catching them right now. <laughs> okay. Um, what else got? So, so you totally stole mine. Um, and, and so now I'm like desperately hunting for the thing that I didn't have in front of me, which was, I was going to recommend at that point over the holidays where you are no longer capable of thinking, speaking, or just generally being extroverted. And we all hit that point, go to the movies. There is an excellent new movie out about the first man on the moon. And uh, this is your chance to go see space portrayed in a way that may allow you to inflict your hobby on those around you with those you love. All right, let's talk video games. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in, you know, me, you're more of the board game person. I'm the video game person here. Yes. Uh, and the game that I have been playing obsessively for the last literally years now uh, is is this game called RimWorld. But the game just released its 1.0 version, so now it is it's fully complete. And they're going to be making updates, but the game is largely done. And it is just the greatest video game that I have ever played. And I can't stop playing it. And I can't imagine there will ever be room in my heart for any other video game. They're all unnecessary. But the the cool thing about about this game, RimWorld, so you, you essentially run a colony of crashed survivors on some for, you know distant planet. And... Uh, you try to keep them alive while all kinds of horrible things are happening. Raids from pirates and, and you know, other uh, local factions in the area. They're building up their technology. They're stockpiling resources. And they're, and they're, but they're all kind of becoming friends and getting along with each other. And people fall in love and out of love and have horrible, um, uh, 
you know, wounds which have the, you know, people have to take care of them and you go on caravans to nearby colonies and towns to trade. And in the end, if you are able to pull it off, you build a spaceship that allows you to escape the planet and fly off into space. Um, but I find it's way more fun to just keep playing on the on the world until uh, you just get overwhelmed by the by the forces arrayed against you. So uh, everyone I have I have recommended this game to from my daughter, my best friends, they're all deeply addicted. So I highly recommend this game. It's called RimWorld, and it's now it's more expensive now that it's sort of version 1.0, uh, but still much cheaper than any other of the AAA games, and will keep you busy for decades. That is impressive. Um, so I was going to recommend a fairly new game called Evo. It's think Minecraft. You need to spin up your own server and things like that. But where where Minecraft doesn't necessarily have a plot and a story, with Evo, you're on a world where you have to go from essentially Stone Age to sufficient technology to not die by the incoming asteroid you see coming. And they take into account that if you do X, it causes pollution and this is bad. So you have to buy, you have to build containment vessels. And so it really forces you to think through the ramifications of your action on your planet. And it's one of these things where you can either screw up by dying violently by asteroid or by just killing yourself with too much pollution. And I, I love the diversity of ways to both live and die in this sim where you're creating your own fate. So if uh, the person in your life uh, or if you have nearly unlimited resources and uh, you want to get something really cool, um, I just want to make an overall general recommendation of a supplier, which is Oceanside Photo and Telescope, which yeah. is a telescope uh, company. They are out of San Diego, and uh, they've been immensely supportive to to some of the cool stuff that we've been doing. And they sell really like introductory stuff, but Everything. they also sell all the really high end, amazing telescopes. So, you know, if you want to build your own backyard observatory with your own pier mount and a an amazing uh, telescope and camera system, uh, definitely give them a call, and uh, and yeah. they will set they will set you up with uh, and, and whatever I've, is the, I've told the this, top. Go ahead. I, I've told this story before, and and it is still the reason why they have my business forever. Yeah. I When when I worked at Harvard, I called them up thinking I knew exactly what I wanted to buy. And when you call up from Harvard, you kind of expect people to try and sell you extra stuff. And they, they stopped me from buying things I didn't need, got me exactly what I needed for less money. And I was super happy and over the years I've called them up after like, I know it's the last minute, can you help me get solar filters for my binoculars for the Venus transit and they couldn't but they had no no qualms recommending I call up their buddies at some other place. I, I really did wait till the last moment. Um, they're good people, they're gonna be honest and they're gonna do right by you and that to me matters yeah. more than almost anything and they have all the stuff and they have it all. Yeah, place. and if it's a really complicated thing, it's important, you know, it's important to have someone be able to make those yeah. decisions and help you figure that out. And and Oceanside has always been up for every madcap scheme that I've had so far, and so highly recommend it. I just you know, again, they haven't provided us any money. Uh, they're not you know some of the you know no, nobody who we're talking to has given us any money. So uh, in some cases, they've sent us samples to review. Yeah, but that's about it. Um, and I've got a couple more quick last minute things I want to make some recommendations as well. Um, a couple more books. One is Lost in Math by Sabina yes. Hassenfelder, who uh, her book is killing it on uh, out there right now. And she is like just taking uh, the state of modern physics to task how a lot of people are chasing what she calls beauty as opposed to more practical physics and uh i think as if you love string theory i require you to read this book <laughs> right exactly and i think you'll find that a lot that a, you know she's ruffled a lot of feathers 
uh, but at the same time has given have given you know given a lot of people uh, some things to think about. The other thing, of course, is the new Paul Sutter book, Your Place in the Universe, yes. just came out. I'm halfway through it and uh, really enjoying it, Paul. And your book. And we'll get there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the uh, Universe Today. Uh, ultimate guide to viewing the cosmos everything you need to know to become an amateur astronomer and that one if you buy copies of this i absolutely make money so just just make sure that you're aware for that shameless self-promotion and and your planets i i have one final thing to recommend and that is uh, I have an Etsy store along with my husband, 739 Studios, and I paint planets. I do this on Saturdays live over on twitch.tv slash starstrider. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of new worlds going up in the next several days, just in time for the holidays. And I do take consignment. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Pamela. And uh, we'll see you next week. Sounds great, Fraser. And now we save. All right, let's hit me. Hit us with your recommendations. Oh, don't stand on the keyboard. Let me just save. But uh, yeah, if you're watching now, I want to, would love to know what you recommend. This was five oh eight. Uh, yes. Um, earlier on, uh, was it, um, Larry Beckham says, why would a foot warmer have Bluetooth? I, I had that exact same question. Please explain. It's so that you can adjust the temperature. Oh, okay. So if your feet decide they're now too warm, you can adjust these things. These are a thing? Yes. Oh, I, I can think of a cold footed wife who could use such a thing. I can't believe that's a real thing. It's totally a real thing. Wow. It is a real thing. Thermocell rechargeable heated insoles. Okay, cool. Madness. Um, uh, and then um, uh, John Suffield said, there's no such thing as a Dobsonian telescope. There are Newtonian telescopes on a Dobsonian mount, which is also that's known true. as a Dobsonian. I mean, are there, does anyone have a refractor Dobsonian? No. The mount doesn't work that way. Yeah. No, I can't imagine how that would work. No. Wait, maybe? If the mount was like higher and it was like really high, no, it just wouldn't work. No, so, that no. is no longer a Dob. That is now something else. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. When you know, it's the short form. Yes, it's absolutely a Newtonian telescope on a Dobsonian mount, but the but it is, it is the short way of saying that is a Dob. Yes. Um, and named after Dobs Dobson James. Yeah. John Dobson. Yeah. Uh, Zafan Zafan is recommending the uh, book Ignition, a funny book about liquid rocket fuel development. John Silva says you can buy a castor grain Dobsonian. That's cool. Uh, I don't even know how that would work. Well, it would be short, right? And I guess it would be a tall Dobsonian, and then you would move it around, right? Okay. Yeah. So that would be great. I mean, I, I saw an Instructables where someone was, was explaining how to build, like, a 27-inch Dobsonian where you need, like, you need a stepladder to be able to see it. Yeah, those those are cool. And if you ever go to the Texas Star Party, there there are people that will bunny hop their ladders as they steer their telescopes. <laughs> it's it's horrifying and yeah. fabulous simultaneously because you're like five feet off the ground on yeah. a ten foot ladder, just oh. bunny hopping the ladder around. Uh, Bill K is recommending Sky Safari Six for Android or iOS. Yes, I got into a bit of an argument with my viewers over on my question show for my YouTube channel. Mm. Yeah, well, someone was like, "What do you think about uh, those the software for Sky Safari and things like that?" And what was my opinion? And my opinion was, they're neat, but not. I don't find them that practical. So. 
like I may, maybe part of the problem is I already know the night sky. And so when I look up in yeah. the sky and I see the constellations and I see the planets and I know where everything is, right? And so I don't need to have an app to hold up. But I don't feel like like that is – is very practical like like it's just like a like the sky is kind of moving around and all these constellations they've got all the pictures drawn and they're all sort of spinning around and you you don't it doesn't really sink in you just kind of go yep whoa that's neat kind of like virtual reality you put on a virtual reality headset and go yep that's neat and then you don't so hook it up again so I, I like things like that for when I'm either in a different place than I'm used to, for mm -hmm. when I can't remember what planets are which. Um, there's So being able to hold them up and go, oh, yeah, that is Mars mm -hmm. or, yeah, that is Jupiter. That's the kind of thing that I like software like Sky Safari for. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I it's just like the amount of information that's in them um, – is not because like like if you're using your regular eyeballs then mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to see all of the faint objects that are detailed in these yeah. apps right you need to be yeah. able to pull out your telescope and if you're going to be using your telescope you're going to be using something that's a little more precise and a little more rugged than that right because again the second you you move the phone away then all of those things spin around right you want to be able to have something that that like a book or a yes. piece of software like Stellarium that you're going to match up with the part of the sky that you're looking around in and then go back and forth with those so it just doesn't feel same thing like you know you're going to hold your phone and you get your binoculars and you're going to be like moving so it just doesn't feel practical in that way for me while something like it, just old school sky charts just get the they, job done. they just they serve different purposes like yeah. if i'm in a bright city and i can see five objects in the entire sky yeah that software helps me figure out what those five objects are yeah uh whoa um, okay someone jim meeker's recommending a low light camera app for the phone are kind of cool nightcap lets you do star trails and long exposure etc so yes. that's something that i was looking for so nightcap that sounds great um something that i can do a longer exposure with my phone camera with because a lot of the tricks that we do you want to be able to to take in that longer exposure and and the phones just their their software that's their built software right in is terrible designed. yeah yeah it's designed to make low light selfies look good yeah you no know. there there's software out there that will allow you to control all the features of your cell phone's camera it's really cool uh, a couple of people are recommending uh, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri which I haven't played that one. I've played every yeah. other. I played the old Alpha Centauri. But Don't I know play Civ Six. Civ Six is terrible. I've got Civ Six. I haven't played it because I'm too busy playing RimWorld. So I, I don't need anything. I could just delete my entire Steam library and now and just play RimWorld. So I don't need to worry about it. Uh, Nightcap. I'm gonna check that out. That's great. So please keep them coming. Uh, so John Sawfield is recommending good and expensive two inch to 1.25 inch adapter, so you can use two inch eyepieces in a telescope that would normally be able to take a 1.25 inch one. And that is great advice. A two inch tel eyepiece. I have one two inch eyepiece for my telescope, and then I have the adapter that goes the other way, so I can use the the crappy little 1.25 eyepieces for a telescope that's designed to use a, a two inch eyepiece, but you just fall into space yeah. when you look through a two inch eyepiece, especially one with a really wide field of view. Um, it's They have a bigger exit people, more light comes yeah. out so they can match the beam of light coming out to the size of your fully dilated eye. Yeah, yeah, just beautiful. And so it's worth spending. You can, you can get like the really expensive, like the plossal ones, they're yeah. in the hundreds and hundreds, but there's some some sort of mid-range two-inch ones, which are uh, like maybe a hundred dollars, hundred and twenty-five dollars, which is you know more than some people will spend on a telescope. But you put that, you attach that to a Dobsonian or even a fairly small telescope, and it just makes a beautiful view of the night sky. So I think that's that's a great recommendation. Yeah, I really love my two-inch eyepiece. Um, what else? I'm going to check out Nightcap. Uh, no, it looks like it's only Apple. Wah, wah. I wonder if th there must be something that's an Android version as well. But one of the issues they run into with Androids is, um, the cameras aren't identical across all hardware. 
so it's much harder to write camera control software for them. Right, right. When they're running all kinds of custom AI and stuff on top of them. Um, Nicholas B is suggesting camel, camel, camel alerts for anything that's sold on Amazon to see what the yes. price trends are and setting alerts when they go down. That's great advice. Um, and use honey to make sure you're getting the best price. Yeah. That's only relevant for you Americans. Uh, I, I wonder if camel, camel, camel works in Canada. I've, that, I've seen it. That and, should. Yeah. Because it just monitors. And saw that was awesome. Boy, you could really get some good deals. And then, but, you know, not for you, filthy Canadian. Just overall Amazon. Aw. Goodbye, she dog. She was squeaking. She was squeaking. I think, needed, I think she needed to go out, so I had Kyle rescue her. Uh, Nicholas B is asking, are there any software-defined radio setups that anyone uses for amateur radio astronomy? Um, I know that you can uh, very easily transform a direct TV into a radio telescope. That's cool. Not a powerful one, but you can do it. It's good enough to find like Sag A star and stuff. Not Sag A star, sorry, Cass A. The supernova. Um, <laughs> uh, Quad Libet wants to have some very detailed conversations about RimWorld. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to. I don't. I don't think people want to hear us nerd out about the details of it. Um, uh, so Nancy linked to the uh, the ZWO ASI one twenty MC camera, which is the 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 so for the relatively inexpensive uh, cameras for astrophotography. Um, yeah, those the monochrome ones. If you want to really get started, go with the monochrome first because you can and then use different filters in front of it to be able to produce a a color image, and then later on you can go with uh, more complicated. There's color ones as well, but you can, you know, a, a CCD just has the greatest detail. Black and white yeah. just gives you the best detail of the image. And so if you then have time on your hands, you can then, you know, take images with different filters and then build it, build up your image, you know, after the fact on your computer in Photoshop. Yeah. Um, and you can watch how to do that with Annie Wilson. Uh, Sunday afternoons on Twitch with Cosmo Quest X. Uh, she's doing that during her office hours. Oh, great. Um, there you go. So Nancy just put up the uh, the ICOM PCR 1000 or FunCube dongle for meteor detection. Uh, can you explain how that works? Does that does it detect them with the direct TV with the radio waves that's cool so I know you can detect meteorites with radio you can you can actually do it with yeah. any old radio if you tune it to between the stations and then go out during a meteor shower you'll hear hear whistles that are the meteors coming and the radio waves get Doppler shifted as they're yeah. reflected off of these moving objects and that's what you're hearing so I don't know this is a little off topic but I don't know if you had heard um uh, there's the Andromedid meteor shower, which is generally a yes. pretty meh meteor shower every year. But in the past, it has been phenomenal. There's been a couple of, the one in 1889 had 10,000 meteors per hour. Wow. And it all comes down to the geometry of, of where we are and if the comet has been outgassing and we pass through the, through the trail. And the thought is, is that it is possible this year on December 3rd, so literally in four days, we're going to have a potential outgap, you know, larger event. So everyone if, check the weather. Yeah. Check go the weather. buy the Bluetooth insoles. <laughs> there you go. And then so take a shot on on the third, the night of the third, go out and see if it's if it's booming. Do you remember the Leonids of 19... No, 2000. It was, uh, 90 99, 2000. I thought. I thought it was the I know summer I had of already started. I thought I had already started Universe Today. But anyway, yeah, there was a, it was, it was the October ish. Yeah. Of, no, it, it was November. absolutely amazing. Yeah. They, some of them were casting shadows. Yeah. And just nonstop. Uh, you just yeah. looked up and it was just meteor, 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 meteor. And that's possible. It was amazing. So definitely. Uh, just give it a shot. Just go outside. Remember the third. Just go outside. Look up. See if you see the sky falling. And if you do, then then go back in. Get a bunch more supplies. Call your friends. Bundle up. Go out. 
and enjoy the meteor shower. Or if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, congratulations. Uh, it's your summer. And, you know, if you live in the Midwest, it may be raining. It will be raining here. Yeah, yeah. I can ju I'll just assume it's going to be raining here. I don't even need to look at the weather. So uh, has anyone else got some recommendations for things that you would buy your uh, space nerd friend? Spouse, so, so Thomas Tranaker is asking, is there a setup that you can use to hunt for planets? Um, so we've pretty much found planets around many of the brightest stars. And you can use that information to follow up and watch future eclipses with backyard telescopes. So you can do that with any system that's extremely well calibrated. That's the trick is you have to have a well calibrated system and a steady sky. You're looking for very small variations in light. Yeah. Um, but folks have done it with four inch telescopes in their driveway. Yep. Yeah. So you don't need to have a really big telescope. You just need to be you need to know what you're doing, know how to use that telescope to do brightness uh, calculations and to be able to help find planets using um, microtransits. So um, micro lensing, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so we've got Bill K is recommending a membership to the Planetary Society and Astro YYZ is recommending a membership to the Royal Astronomical Society Club of Canada. So that's a great idea, too. I think all of those are fair ideas. There you go. Harry Patrick's saying it was November 2001. So that's when we saw the last, the Leonids. And so we could have something like that. It is possible for the Andromedids. Is it bedtime? I'm, I got a puppy. <laughs> it's like having a child. Oh, <laughs> man. Um, we totally covered the Cosmo. Quest X t-shirts and swag from Redbubble. But yes, they're they're worth repeating again. Yeah. Uh, CosmoQuest X on Redbubble. Now, do we want to pre-announce any larger events that may be happening sometime in December? We can do that. So December, the weekend of December 22nd, we're going to do a 40-hour hangout a thon. It's going to start Saturday morning. It's going to end in those hours between Sunday and Monday going into Christmas Eve for some of you. And we're going to be working to raise $60,000 between now and then for CosmoQuest so that we don't have to fire everybody for Christmas. Um, I That's literally what we're doing. Yep. Uh, we, we'd been warned, uh, I think it was right after IAU, that there was a chance that due to JWST cost overruns, due to new policies with citizen science, that we might be getting some funding cuts and our funding got cut. And what I'm looking at right now is come January 1, we have jobs, but no paycheck. And um, so I'm trying to raise money to keep my staff who have kids who have others that they're taking care of who have tuition to pay to keep them going until we can find new grant money i'm only going to pay myself off grant money i have a husband to pay the mortgage um but there's a lot of people we're trying to scoop up and carry until we can find another way and we've always succeeded in the past with your help all right. We're asking for your help one more time. All right. Well, we will uh, we'll give you more news as we approach the Hangout-a-thon and all of the guests that we're going to be organizing and all the special events we're going to be doing. So obviously uh, I'll be part of it, and uh, a lot of our other Astro friends will be there too. So, All right. Uh, well, let's wrap things up. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, big thanks to Nancy for posting all of the links to all the stuff that we were talking about in the chat. That was great. So um, thanks, Nancy. Uh, thanks, everyone watching us. Again, if you want to be part of the community that joins us every episode, the one that's right there, um, go to wshcrew.space, and they'll give you all the instructions so that you can uh, join up and be a part of the community. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Pamela. And uh, we will see you all uh, next week. I'm going to be in Hawaii. Um, OK next friday and the friday after that i will be traveling back home although late so i will be able to do 
astronomy cast, but I won't be able to engineer astronomy cast. So we'll have to figure I can this do out. That. And it may well have to be that we'll have to do it offline and just make it a, a phone call and we record. So there will okay. be episodes coming, but we may not be able to do the live streams. We'll sort. All right. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.